table if the microphones can all go on. And as panellists, you can speak directly into the microphone because it's still all being recorded for posterity and for usefulness on the internet. Um, I was just thinking there will be a chance for um, Chinese people to use immersive um, goggles, the new technology, and be able to walk in the paddocks with... Sam and Simone as they graze their cattle. So I, I, I can see that happening, not just be able to see a picture of them. Um, I, before I take one question, I might actually just ask um, a question that was put to me. If, if I had Andrew Robb in the room, we'd ask, how do you plan to export 800,000 cattle to China? <laughs> that question comes up again. So the big export plans from Kidman. Um. We, Australia currently exports 1.3 million live cattle and a lot more sheep. Um, and uh, the, issue is, the issue has been uh, meeting the uh, health protocol, um, which is very strong and tough, and still making a quid out of it if you're going to do that. So um, we ended up uh, with a very safe procedure where the cattle go into quarantine here and are fed. They then go to an island off the coast uh, of Shanghai and get fed again um, and then they get slaughtered on the island. And the only thing that arrives in the mainland is fresh meat. And at the moment Chinese can buy a lot of chilled beef and frozen beef, but they can't buy fresh beef from Australia, right, or anywhere else. And that. that's an avenue. And this, you know, it won't replace um, a lot of the trade that's developing already. It'll just, in my view, you know, all boats will rise in the beef industry with, if you put another market like that over time, it's, you couldn't supply it tomorrow, but you can start supplying it tomorrow. And... Um, and, and they're demanding fresh meat, right? And um, uh, so that's 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 what's in prospect. That's mm -hmm. what's the deals that have been done, starting with up to three hundred thousand in the next little while, and and then taking it from there. Mm. Do we have questions from the floor? I can ask some more questions. Um, yes. We can have a microphone down to you in that way you can, <coughs> so, <laughs> well he'll be able to hear you, now everybody else can hear you. Just on the, um, the trade with China, there's obviously been a few issues arisen in the beef sector, um, you know, last year's problems with labelling um, and the issues that Victoria have had with um, the potential BTV this year, um, I suppose are you seeing those issues flow outwards into negotiations you're having with China and, and do you have sort of contingency plans if those issues arrive, sorts of issues arise in your negotiations given it's such a um, large number of stock? Um, well, the, the only negotiations I'm doing now um, uh, are negotiations at a commercial level, so company to company. Etc. Right. So, I'm reliant on the federal and state governments um, and the contingency plans that they've got. Uh, I think there's um, a very comprehensive um, presence of federal and state officials across China. You know, the trade commissioners and the consuls and the ambassador. Of course, she's fantastic. She did. She was my chief negotiator in. Uh, all the trade deals, Jan Adams, and just an outstanding person. Um, so they're very alert nowadays because of the importance of the market to what's happening. Um, some of these issues, as you um, would, would understand, us, I'm sure, that um, it's not just the fact that a stamp was on the inside but not on the outside or vice versa of a box of beef out of hundreds of boxes. I mean, sometimes there's other issues uh, sort of come into this. Technically, um, we have something to fix, and we will, and we have. And But, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of 
geopolitics, and that's with the whole transition that's taking place in our region, which is almost unprecedented um, in, in history, from all of these countries being in a developing country status to, to now um, re returning, as I said, in some cases, China and, and uh, India, to being what they were for centuries, um, thousands of years, in fact. Um, it, it's going to put all sorts of pressures, and I think Australia can play a port, when, you know, we're a middle power, and we're, we're, we're respected, and we can play a role in ensuring that the next hundred years is not one of um, hostility, but it's one of prosperity and peaceful transition to a, to, to a state where um, billions of people literally um, come to enjoy the quality of life that, as Australians, we already enjoy. Thank you. Um, I might ask Woolworths, in that context of the global demand for beef and lamb, um, it's already pushed prices up for domestic consumers. Where do you see that um, Woolworths has to keep positioning, um, you know, while China and India forever grow? Um, thank you. Well, I think we're, we've learnt today, and I think we're all pretty much aware that I think prices will remain very high as as we've spoken about, Australia continues to provide more protein to the rest of the world. So um, we we live with that, and we we adjust we adjust to that. I mean, to be to be truthful, I think if we looked at those domestic consumption graphs, and if um, Woolies and others had have passed on all of the cost increase that we've seen through our supply chain, you'd actually see those um, the, the the retail sell price much higher than what it is. So very conscious that we need to help Australian families with their budget by um, offering great value and great quality so you know we continue to absorb uh, a lot of cost increase um, to, to still offer that value to Australian families so they can afford to have that healthy diet and a balance of protein. And this is where of course your packaging comes in, you are targeting much tighter um, a tighter product I suppose, a much more marketable product. Yeah, I think um, the next packaging evolution, um, which industry calls skin pack, we call it sealed fresh um, in Woolies. We don't think skin pack's actually very customer friendly. So, but I think we've, you know, I mean, supermarkets and butcher shops and others have been selling, um, you know, pre packed meat or, or packaged meat since the 60s and 70s. And I mean, that started out very much being like the lad wrap from home over, over um, some type of tray. And, and in, you know, probably recent years, we moved to modified atmosphere packaging for, for a lot of product. Um, whilst modified atmosphere packaging was designed to, to meet some customer needs, so custom, you know, one of the biggest irritant from a customer with pre-packed meat was, was leakers. You know, so the meat you know, actually leaked from, from the overwrap. So MAP was introduced, one, to satisfy that, that uh, irritant from customers, also um, other things around shelf life and those things, but really was never all that consumer friendly, takes up a lot of room in the fridge, couldn't be frozen and those types of things. So the evolution that we're seeing now through um, skin packed or field sealed fresh packaging is, is smaller packs, um, much more convenient. And one of the benefits of, of sealed fresh packaging is that um, the meat continues to mature. Um, so tenderness is, is enhanced through, through that process. So we see that as the exciting next evolution, as you've already seen in other proteins as well. So um, is there another question? Because I could ask... Oh, OK. <laughs> That's sudden. All right. Um, so there's a microphone behind here and gentleman in the middle there. Thank you. Yeah, Rodney Lush, uh, primary producer from Keith. Uh, question to Michael. Um, <coughs> EIDs seem to... Um, complete the full circle between the consumer um, d demands for provenance, trust, reliability and the, the paddock. Victoria's bitten the bullet and got a mandatory EID scheme. In South Australia, the, the rank and file are circling the wagons. We don't want the mandatory EID. When I say we, I'm a, I use them, but the early adopters and the innovators are OK with that. How do you see the, you know, is it going to need a carrot or a stick to sort of complete that at a national level in terms of EID utilisation? Um, yeah, look, it, it's a really good, good question. I, I tend to think objective carcass measurements is the carrot for us 
to move away from averaging and to move to individual animal management and to get paid on individual animals. So you actually need a link, and that link is EID. So I'd like to personally see you know, that, that it evolves through the carrot of OCM, but I do make the point that government has actually been a bit of an enabler by having mandatory EID in Victoria. And, you know, from a, a, I've got to be careful, I represent Sheep Producers Australia, and we, um, we I would argue personally that, that it's quite good one state goes first, irons out the bugs, sees, sees if it's practical. It might not be, who knows. Um, so, but I, I personally think a mandatory path isn't what we want nationally. I think the carrot being objective carcass measurements and being paid for what we produce is what should drive it. And then on farm we go, oh, guess what? We can link all this stuff together. We can link what I, what I fed those animals or the genetics I used. And then we get evolutionary change. And those early adopters I talked about, they're in our industry and they want that. With the meat processors helping to fund the DEXA technology rollout, do you see that you're going to lose some of that control over the data? Well, that, that's actually one of the fundamental reasons why we have to use our levies to actually invest in this technology so that we have access to the data. And that's another reason why if, if we just said, oh, no, look, the market's going to do it. The processors need to get more efficient. They're going to want to automate. So they'll, they'll get these DEXA machines and they'll, they'll automate along. The problem with that is if, if only one or two of them do that, you actually don't have enough competition for and a price signal back to me for good behaviour. And then we face the massive risk of consolidation in the processing industry. Um, and we as farmers are inherently um, fiercely independent. Um, and, but there are a lot of us, whereas processors, there aren't that many. And we don't want to have monopoly, oligopoly control. That's why we say, hey, let, let's get them all to get the technology and then they can all compete effectively. We have a question here. Yeah, Greg Harper, University of Melbourne Commercial. Michael, you flagged your view on sale yards as a personal view, but seeing what you've now seen through the Nuffield Scholarship, have you seen some other ways that um, you know, supply can occur? It, it's clearly the case that you know, state governments and Infrastructure Australia see sale yards as an important contribution to regional infrastructure. Are you foreseeing an alternative? Yeah, um, sale yards will actually always have a purpose. No, no question about that. The point I was trying to make is that collection system creates price. So it's very short-term supply and demand of price. Um, you know, I'm all, and, and it creates that adversarial relationship. I was fascinated on, on the Nuffield, you know, you, you, you meet a, um, a, a cider manufacturer and he goes, oh, I'm putting, uh, I'm trying this new variety. And I go, oh, how long does it take for the grower to grow the tree? He said, oh, 20 years. And you go, how do you get your grower to commit that long, long term? And it, fundamentally it's about relationships, isn't it? And, and what we have in a, in a sale yard, we don't have that relationship. How do we evolve? To, to being paid on provenance, quality. And, and I'm saying OCM is just the first kind of stage in it, how we evolve. And it's as much about changing our behaviour as producers and our kind of, I hate to use that word, culture, but our culture of behaviour. So I think we'll have sale yards, but they, they might act more like collection systems. I saw a lot of it in UK where you, after the foot and mouth disease, they changed their, their um, systems quite drastically. Um, and that resulted in some changes of their price discovery. And on that, um, supermarkets buy direct. So do you want to just mention how much you buy direct and whether that's going to only increase? Oh, yeah, I can, I can only talk for Woolworths. Um, but um, <laughs> obviously, you know, with our, our cattle supply, we've been direct farm relationships with our cattle suppliers now for over 20 years. And in more recent years, we've been able to... to transition our, our lamb supply. So we're pretty much buying 80% of our, our lambs across the, the course of the year with direct relationships and partnerships with, with Australian farmers. Um, obviously, where you get the spring flush and, and other things, that it's, it's difficult for even our most strategic farmer partners to, to get all the lambs direct into us at, at one time. So they still will use a sale yard method. But um, the Woolies way is to, to build enduring partnerships over time directly with our farmers and, and that's very similar in our fruit and veg business as well so 
Could, have a question down the front here. Could I? Add, oh, sorry, Andrew. Just on that that issue, um, you know, people talk about paddock to plate. Um, a lot of it, that concept has been around for some time with the Woolies and the Coles, and they've actually and and you go into the sugar industry, Wilma. You know, the biggest sugar producer now in Australia in their own right, but also they've got, I don't know how many, but uh, hundreds, I think, who are under contract, and they give them, they give them, they, they provide cheap finance, um, and they have an extension team that Wilma runs, and there has to be mutual agreement about what that money is invested in on the property, uh, not a new tractor. Um, different irrigation system or whatever. Now they've seen, I think, up to 30% increase in productivity. They've got the best growers in the industry. Uh, the old ones who don't, don't, you know, 75 year olds who want to get out, they're buying them out. But it's it's like Costa. In, it's all heading towards the direct relation. It doesn't mean that farms are owned because I think we've got a very efficient family farm um, system in Australia. But um, there is a financial connection and they're contracted and that's where you get, I bet uh, Woolies would, um, you know, th they would be picking the eyes out of the good growers and, and together working on how they provide something that you can sell effectively. We have a question at the front. Michael Southen from Grain Growers Limited. Um, question for Michael. With the objective quality testing uh, technologies you've <laughs> described for carcasses, can that be applied for live animals so that we can get a similar measurement of quality from live sheep and live cattle such as those going up to China so that the customers who are processing them there can still get equivalent information on, uh, on the quality of, of that, that particular animal and also the producers can get feedback as well. So we're not just, it's great to have it here domestically but, but we are export focused so can those technologies be rolled out into the export markets? Yeah, look, I'm not a complete expert on it, to be honest. Um, you know, I would have thought that that would be one of the, the goals, wouldn't it? Um, Richard, up the back there, do you want to add anything? So I just, uh, Richard Apps from, from MLA, so he kind of knows the technology gig. I just kind of have the big kind of like the ideas kind of vaguely. In terms of the, uh, the, the Rural R&D for Profit Program supported uh, arm tech program that Michael mentioned, it's primarily focused on carcasses, but we're also looking at the, the application, particularly of some X-ray uh, and some microwave technologies that may be able to manage, measure carcass quality attributes in live animals. And, and whether we could use that in the export market. I think that's where you, you're really coming from. Yep. And that could be applied anywhere, whether it's in a seed stock uh, selection process, whether it's in a feedlot process, whether it's in a establishing a value at a, at a market point, whether it be domestic or export. Thanks, Richard. Uh, early days. Is there another question from the floor? Ah, yes, down the front, yes. Thank you. Um, Annabelle from Fairfax Media, Michael. This is a bit towards you, but what do you see as being the catalyst to move towards your sort of supply chain vision? And also a completely different question. Is, um, Pat, it's probably one for you to both contribute to. Do you think that the Woolies pricing of lamb is having an impact on the reputation of lamb being a premium product? <coughs> That's a vague question. But I just want to know whether, from a pricing perspective, whether you think that it's, it is um, the discounted meat, whether it still suits the marketing um, angle of lamb being a premium product. As a premium premium product. What, what I heard from Pat before was that they're, they're doing a great community service for us all by, by feeding us good protein at, at, and taking this massive loss. Not, not massive loss. <laughs> and and she, you guys should read yours not for it. Don't take me wrong, Pat. Um, but it is, you're right, it is a halo product. If they, I'm sure they know, and Pat probably knows this better, that, that you know, if, if my wife puts, if I, I'm not really allowed to shop her, it's such a bad job. Um, if I put red meat in my in my, my trolley, I'll tend to buy higher purchase other products. So um, you probably are taking a little hit on it, but it drives a lot of other things. And I, you know, on farm, we're still getting the, the signals of average. How, how do we move to this kind of big picture idea that we get paid on on yield and eating quality? The the, the first stage is by by setting up a measurement system. That that's what we're really at. Okay, measure it, create some transparency. And over time, we, we evolve. And it'll be pretty simple. If, 
if I sold animals in a sale yard and I got a hundred bucks and then I go, oh, there's all this data come back. What's that? Oh, okay. I look on LDL and I, uh, I can just make a grid and go, do you know what? On lean meat yield, they're actually worth more than that or less than that. I get signals. And I think that's how we evolve and change. Well, hopefully it's, it, you're right. So the question is, what's going to drive it? Is there going to be some shock to the system? Is there going to be, um, you know, is it incentivised by, by prices for me? I probably live in a bit of a naive world that, that I'll be incentivised by the processor telling me, hey, you've got a better yielding product, I'm going to pay you more. You've got a better eating quality, I'm going to pay you more. Or I, I start getting discounts and I change behaviour that way. I, I don't, it's not going to be overnight but we can see where industry will be heading in five to 10 to 15 years time. Will biosecurity push us there? Uh, don't know, hope not. Yeah, sorry, Pat. I, you can turn this one. Yeah, I'm just trying to talk there. Um, geez, that was a nice little conversation between the two of you, sorry to spoil it. Um, so. <laughs> Oh, look, I think, I think the fact is that if we go back in the history of protein in Australia, for, for many, many, many years, lamb was seen as a cheap alternative to beef because historically lamb was um, cheaper. Um, that changed with, you know, two consecutive long, long, long periods of drought. So there was a period where lamb became so expensive that it almost became unaffordable for many, many Australian families. In more recent years, we've seen beef prices rise significantly, so you know the two are, are, are probably level pegging at the moment. And you saw the graph on on the growth of 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 poultry, and poultry prices basically hasn't changed in a decade. So, but you know, to everyone, affordability and premium and and is is a different thing. I think um, I think the thing about lamb today is that um, for many people, um, lamb still is that. That alternative, um, lamb's highly is bought um, highly promotable. So when lamb is on special, people, families' consumption of lamb grows. So it, it is price sensitive. Um, but of course, the whole piece about um, waste, so food waste, and also um, people eat differently today. So you know, days gone by. Last night's lamb roast was you know today's lunch, and and quite frankly, you know, a lot of families don't don't consume food like that anymore, so it's enough for me at home, which has seen that smaller cuts are becoming more important. Um, and from a grower's point of view, average weights of lamb is, is, is rising. So, you know, there's, con there's contradictions all through our supply chain at the moment and singles, whilst for an export market and, fr and from a lamb producer to, to grow heavier, fatter lambs is, is a great return. Um, the consumer's actually saying that we want you know, smaller pieces of, of, of meat, we want less waste at, at home, and we want meat to be a little bit more affordable. So, you know, there's many messages there. I might ask a question of Jack Mullenby, though. I mean, um, while this microphone's going up there, Western Queensland's received some good rains. Has that been factored into prices, or is that too short term? Um, yeah, so we we're probably expecting herd rebuilding to continue throughout this year and then and then next year, and most of that's a price signal thing coming through. Um, and we're expecting Northern Australia to be slow generally because of reasonably poor conditions. So it might be a little bit quicker than we're anticipating, but the lag effects will probably leave it till next year at least at this rate. But it's good news um, and hopefully good news for prices as well. There was a question at the back, yeah. Yeah, Chad Bacon, pr producer at Keith. Um, probably following on, Pat, with, uh, I guess, consumers not consuming as much meat going into the future, um, where do we see our export for protein? Do we still see that increasing with the forecast of an increase of population, or do you think the, the decrease of a daily protein consumption is going to make that plateau out? Um, look, I, I, I think I'm, I'm correct in saying that right now we're seeing a you know, significant increase in, in lamb uh, exports. I, I think that will continue. Obviously, the New Zealand situation um, is also having, having a factor there. So as New Zealand's exporting um, less product, 
um, because of their availability. I think, um, I think I'm correct in saying that basically the, the flock uh, numbers in New Zealand are their lowest since you know, the early, early 50s, mid 50s. I don't think there's any sign of recovery of the lamb situation in New Zealand. So I think Australia will continue to be you know, that, that source of supply um, for export moving forward. So I don't see the, the global demand slowing at all. So I'll just cut in that. We're a little bit more uh, cautious on the New Zealand side, and, and part of that's to do with um, some of the dairy regulations that may or may not unfold over the next five years. Um, but they're likely to, to have an effect on what happens to the NZ flock and competition in the markets. We're not expecting a mad increase in New Zealand exports, but um, there's some potential for them to claw back some of the market share, particularly in the EU and, and China. Um, but, but fundamentally, we're a little bit more optimistic about them growing, I think, over the medium term. Well, that really uh, probably concludes the discussion. Was there any other quick statements you'd like to make? Or that wraps it? I've seen um, the... You, you, t you spoke about the rapid increase in packaged, ready-to-eat convenience food, and I've, I've seen Andrew's Meats in Western Sydney, and they've got um, a big growing division of, of sous vide, so this is the plastic-sealed meat, flavoured, cooked very slowly in massive tubs, about six of them, you know, sw swimming pool size, um, and that's, you know, that's becoming the fa their fastest growing area, even though they've still got their primal cuts. So I think we've had from this panel, you know, the theme of Australian meat, the importance of branded, of value-added, all the way to the ready-to-eat pre-cooked meals. And, but still, from the producer's perspective, we're seeing 66% of the sheep going through the sale yards. I might add, it's actually uh, a lot back further this year, so we're actually starting to try to build relationships, which is good. That is, yeah. So the, the growth, obviously, of direct buying um, and producers still wanting to see the value add come back um, with messages of where they need to develop their genetics. So um, Australian meat no longer a bulk wholesale commodity to China. It is a specialty commodity, value added, and um, a primal cut is the important thing. So I think thanks to the panel for their really insightful um, information today from Jack, Andrew, and <laughs> Michael, and Pat. Thank you very much. Thank you.